amazing thing. And I'm really excited. We also have the visuals. We have some beautiful art to embody the thinking and the writing. So uh, thanks for making that happen. And uh, thank you all for traveling all this way to uh, come to the Arizona and the desert and bring the word to us. So I appreciate that very much. So I'm going to turn it over to you all. Thank you uh, for that introduction, uh, Ron. And uh, so, yeah, yeah, welcome to uh, today's panel, African Futures Urban Imaginaries. Uh, I'm going to introduce our speakers and sort of explain uh, a little bit, and then uh, we'll hand over the floor to our uh, to our participants. Um, but first, I think uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are currently occupying colonized lands, uh, formerly uh, indigenous people groups of the Akamela, Odom, and Pipash. Um, and I'd also like to thank the Institute for Humanities Research and Ron Brolio and the Center for Science and Imagination and Bob Beard for funding and facilitating this fantastic e event. Um, also, uh, a, a big thank you to our participants here um, for today's panel, uh, where we're really focusing on the, the, the concept of building new worlds through creativity and imagination. Um, and so uh, we have with us today, uh, who has traveled a very long distance, uh, Pemi Aguda from uh, Lagos, Nigeria, who uh, will publish her debut short story collection, Ghost Roots, next year, early in 2024. Um, as well as her debut novel, The Suicide Mothers, which will be forthcoming in 2025. Uh, she was the 2022 McDowell Fellow, a graduate of Helen Zell Writers Program, and her work has appeared in Plowshares, Zoetrope, Ranta, Z-Y-Z-Z-Y-B-A, <laughs> and uh, American Short Fiction in One Story. Um, and if you're interested, we have these bookmarks that you saw as you came in. Uh, it has the titles of their works printed on the back for reference so that you can keep up after you leave this afternoon. Uh, next in line, and I'm just going to go in order so that it's logical so that you can match faces, we have Yvette Lisa Ndlovu, who is uh, Zimbabwean Sarungano, which is a term that she can explain more than I can, which is a uh, sort of traditional storyteller. Um, and her debut short story collection, Drinking from Graveyard Wells, also on the bookmark, is forthcoming um, in one month. Yes, yeah. So very exciting things. Uh, she was selected for the 2021 UPK New Poetry and Prose Series. Um, she also has a novel manuscript that is uh, in progress and will be forthcoming uh, soon. Um, uh, she, her work has been supported by fellowships from the Tin House Workshop, Red Loaf Writers Workshop, and the New York State Summer Writers Institute. She's the co-founder of Voodoo Knots Summer Workshop for Black Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers. And her work has been anthologized in World Fantasy, award-winning anthology, Year's Best African Speculative Fiction, and the NAACP Award-nominated anthology, Africa Risen. Um, And there's more. There's more. Uh, we are so fortunate to have uh, with us uh, this distinguished uh, set of panelists. Um, Granville Carroll is a visual artist uh, from Arizona State University, uh, Afrofuturist working with digital technology, poetry, and alternative processes to reshape the world. So there are these sort of threads that carry through all of our, our panelists. Um, and uh, if you've noticed the decor in this room, uh, these are original artworks of Granville Carroll's. So as you're sitting here listening to the conversations, you can also be pondering. Um, and then afterwards, when we have Q&A, uh, we can engage more in detail with that. Uh, lastly, in the end, we have Jenna Hanchi who is going to be playing the role of moderator for today's panel. Uh, she's a professor of rhetoric and critical cultural studies at ASU, 
She uses decolonial and anti-racist theory to examine Western aid and development initiatives in Africa. And in addition to studying African futurism, she writes speculative fiction herself. Um, and also has a book forthcoming in 2023 out of Duke University Press yes. called Collapse of a Tanzanian NGO. It's called uh, The Center Cannot Hold Decolonial Possibility in the Collapse of a Tanzanian NGO. Thank you. Is it my turn? Please. All right. Well, thank you so much, Isaac, for introducing our panelists. And now we're we're just going to have a, a semi-guided conversation, basically ab about your work and and what it is doing to uh, imagine better and different futures. Whether or not the work itself is set in the future, how how can we use that to imagine outside of the boundaries of what we've been given? Um, and so, I guess I want to just start out with asking you all: How would you describe or situate your work? Would you call it? Afrofuturist, African futurist, Afro surrealist, and what what does it mean to you to describe your work in certain ways? And what do you think? Um, uh, how how do you how do you situate it in relation to these concepts? I'll go first. Um, so as Isaac mentioned, I classify myself as an Afro futurist. Um, a lot of my work is based on my own personal experience. Growing up in America, being part of the African diaspora. Um, and so the ideas that I formulate in my artwork deals with like origin stories and trying to understand, you know, where I come from without having that knowledge or connection to traditional culture or ancestry. Um, and so then I also tap into aspects of African mythology or cosmology to find that connection in self. In, in the landscape. Uh, so I guess you can say it's a blend of African futurism and Afrofuturism, uh, but more so than towards the Afro art. Um, and part of this work that you see on the wall, so it's two different projects. But one of the projects is called Because the Sun Have Looked Upon Me, um, which is examining that relationship of self with philosophy, science, science fiction, technology. Um, and then also my own struggles with religion and Christianity and, you know, understanding the colonization, of, you know, the colonizing mindset of Christianity within African nations and how does that situate me here in America. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot sort of embedded in these concepts that I'm working with. But, yeah. um, I would situate my own work within afro surrealism. So afro surrealism is about telling the narrative of the contemporary Black experience, these experiences being so uh, absurd and so surreal that, you know, they seem surreal, uh, unreal. I think uh, one of, like, I guess the most popular examples of afro surrealism is Jordan Peele's uh, film Get Out, where we have this uh, sunken place being uh, a metaphor to explore uh, the legacy of racism and slavery in uh, America. And in my uh, in my own work, uh, Breaking from Grave at Wells, uh, my work blurs the lines between realism, surrealism, um, and a bit of Afrofuturism um, to uh, talk about uh, Black women in Zimbabwe living under uh, the Mugabe dictatorship and kind of exploring that, uh, that space. Thank you. Um, I guess, when we think about like Afrofuturism and African futurism, I get hung up on the futurism part of it because I wonder like how far in the future are we looking for it to return futurism? But in the sense that African futurism is concerned with African concerns and rooted first and foremost in Africa, then I think my work is interested in those things also. Um, I, my stories tend to sprawl all the way around the spectrum from like horror to magical realism sometimes it's just like straight up realism um so i guess the broadest term would just be speculative of fiction or just elements of strange in my work but i think a lot of my work is very interested in the present mm -hmm. and the past and like, the accumulation of the past to where we are now I'm interested in from each of these different perspectives of your work, uh, thinking Afrofuturist, Afro-surrealist, Afro and even you know realist, and thinking, um, what do you see your work as doing to open 
or what kinds of things are you are, are you trying to do with your work? Um, is it open imaginative possibilities? Is it reflect on current societal structures? Um, it, what, do you, what do you hope that your work is accomplishing? Yeah, as a visual artist, uh, mainly a photographer, <clears throat> using, um, you know, obviously a camera and Photoshop to create these worlds, my hope is to shift perspectives, right? Um, a lot of what I've been exploring in the last, I guess, five or so years is considering uh, the impact of representation in the media um, and what is my role as a Black man, as a Black artist, to combat these narratives um, and provide something that's a little bit more expansive and has more depth than just look at the Black person on the screen. Um, and so, you know, I create these new states of being is what I like to call them. Um, they're self-portraits, but I don't see it as just be me telling a story about self, but more so being a vessel in which the cosmos can enter and be expressed. Um, so yeah, so I just hope that, you know, whether it's conscious or subconscious, that the work is shifting the minds of, you know, everyone who's looking at it to see Blackness as expansive, as beautiful, as divine, as powerful, um, and as multidimensional as the cosmos themselves. Um, so with my work engaging with Afro-surrealism, Afro-surrealism like looks at the right now, whereas Afrofuturism is, you know, speculating on futures. I think Afro-surrealism focuses on the contemporary moment so we can make uh, Afro-futures possible by critiquing systems of power in the real world. So I use magic uh, and the fantastical and the surreal to uh, critique um, systems of power uh, in the real world. Uh, one of the stories from uh, my short story collection, Drinking from Graveyard Wells, um, is about a, a community where houses are disappearing uh, in that neighborhood um, every night. And the question is, where are these houses going and these families in those houses? And uh, who is next? So using that, uh, those disappearing houses to talk about neocolonialism in Zimbabwe as well as uh, gentrification. So um, that's kind of like how I approach it, is using this magic to look at the real world. I think my work also operates similarly that way. I also think about um, this, there's a quote by Julio Cortaza where he talks about reality being multiple and infinite mm -hmm. and how fantastical fiction isn't just escapism, but it's a contribution to living like, the world more fully. And so I'm hoping that my work is an invitation for people to consider the different kinds of realities that we have, because that is what strangeness is. And even though my work is termed under speculative fiction, I think for many people where I come from, like unreality is reality, like strangeness is mundane. And so I'm inviting people to see that we have different baselines for reality and that, you know, we can open up to see that. Yeah. Um, my novel, like similar to you, my novel, is thinking about who, this, who the future of the city of Lagos belongs to. And so there's a strange premise, but at the bottom of it is who does the city belong to and who are these futures of the city that, you know, that urban development is going towards, like, is it everybody that is thinking about? And so when I'm thinking, when I use employ strangeness in my work, the strangeness is not necessarily the point, but it's to invite us to maybe look more closely at what is existing already? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. um, I'm interested in that element of strangeness that we're we're pulling out, and also of um, imagining beyond or different worlds than the ones that we're supposed to see uh, ourselves as occupying. Um, uh, whether that be, you know, in a futuristic way or in a, a surrealist and strange way, um, and I'm wondering what kinds of what kinds of affordances does that give readers to be exposed to strangeness, to seeing the world in new ways? And um, how do you think, I know the, the role of the panel is kind of thinking about uh, what this does for future cities, what this does for how we build futures. Um, what, what kinds of affordances do we have in, in seeing the strangeness now for how that impacts futures? Even if that's not directly what you're writing about. <laughs> Yeah, so my work engages a lot with Ubuntu, which is 
uh, a Southern African philosophy that's often translated to I am because we are, and since we are, therefore I am, that human beings have this symbiotic relationship uh, with each other and to the earth and the life forms um, that exist uh, on this planet. And so um, in one of the stories in my uh, collection, you have um, these politicians that are um, that want to build a hydroelectric uh, dam, and then uh, the mermaids were pushing back uh, against that. And so the uh, the politicians are saying, "Oh, you know, if we build this dam, this is electricity, this is progress." And there's this anxiety uh, amongst uh, politicians and you know the governments back home that we have to catch up to the West, we have to build, we have to develop. Um, and I kind of critique that model of uh, development. That is, is this, you know, the, is the Western model the only model of development? And you know, what is that model? It is resource extraction. Um, it is exploitation. Uh, it is environmental degradation. And is that the model that we want to follow? So the mermaids in that story invoke Ubuntu. That um, you building this dam that means human progress for the humans in the land uh, will flood uh, the areas, will destroy uh, ecosystems. So is that progress? Is human advancement? the progress of the entire planet and what is progress, uh, basically. So uh, my work uh, is Ubuntu-centered and thinking about how can we build uh, Ubuntu-centered presence and, you know, carry that forward into uh, the future. It's okay. Okay. <laughs> Well, one other thing I'm also thinking about, because um, Penny and Granville, you both mentioned the past and how that implicates is implicated in your work. So I'm interested in hearing um, how, how, how does the past um, impact the way that you are writing and, and what kinds of things you're writing and then uh, what your what, what are your hope, how does that inflect, I guess, your work? Okay. Um... I think that a lot of the stories I write, especially the ones who fall under horror, tend to be a lot about the past because um, I, at some point in my 20s, I had this whole crisis about whether I was myself or if I was just like a, like a continuation of whether, you know, if it was, you know, the whole thing about like faith versus choice. And how much of me is me versus what my mother tells me to do, what society tells me to be. And so um, these are the things I'm, I'm thinking about, just like what we've inherited and how how we find ourselves like replicating these behaviors and traumas and like taking it into the future and how we can't expect different things if we don't consider where we've come from. Um, and in, in terms of like the city, about how I, I ran across some quotes about how like the dead and the living are that like, contributes to what makes it easy. So it's not just about the now, it's about what came before us. And so I just really want my work to acknowledge what has come before and have us like ask questions because I think like when I grew up in Lagos, history was not on the syllabus. Like they really took out history from schools. And I think it's impossible for us to um, prepare for a future without thinking about how we go to where we are. Yeah, yeah I definitely want to second that. Um, <clears throat> you know, for me, it's, I was just telling you earlier that, um, you know, thinking about the enslavement of Africans here in America um, and that legacy that I come from, that I am their future, right? <clears throat> Um, and that Afrofuturism existed well before it was coined in the 90s by Mark Derry, that in order for them to survive, to, you know, dream to hope of the impossible, that they could exist in a world in which they're not, you know, tied and beaten and, you know, all the horrific things that you can mention, um, is a really powerful idea and concept for me. And so, like, the way I think about time is not just a, you know, linear progression, right, but I think about it as a circle. Um, and I'm always trying to reach that origin point that always seems so fleeting. Um, and so I just, you know, think about time as a, as a circle that's expanding and contracting, um, and it's just falling, off, falling back onto itself, you know, like a fractal. Um, and so, yeah, so, you know, today is the present, tomorrow is the future, um, but today is also the future, you know, in reference to the past. 
um, and that we have to respect that the sacrifices, right, all the things that happened in order for us to be here today, but then take that into account to say which world do we want to create for ourselves and, you know, future generations as well, so. Anything? <laughs> yeah, I love that because uh, I'm always saying Harriet Tubman was an Afrofuturist because she could, and other abolish abolitionists could imagine uh, a world where Black people were free. So all those revolutionaries were Afrofuturists, even though that term, you know, hadn't been coined. It was, you know, they still embodied that. I love the call to think on different terms of time and temporalities as well, because in the West and particularly in white Western spaces, we are uh, conditioned to think of time as only linear and that institutes a certain path of development, like Yvette was saying, uh, that your story talks about, right? Challenging, because Western development is based in fundamentally linearity, that there's one direction you're going and that's the only direction to go. And screwing with time, or taking uh, perspectives of time that exist in other places um, messes with, with, with that fundamentally in a way that I think is really key. Um, I am interested, since Grandpa brought up time, if you all have any reflections on the way that time or temporality works in, in your own work. Um, and if not, that's okay. I'm going off book now. Um. Yeah, so I would actually recommend uh, one of my friends' work, um, a novella called And This Is How to Stay Alive by uh, Shingai Kakunda, who's a Kenyan uh, author, and it's a time travel uh, novella um, that is based on an East African conceptualization of time, that uh, time is uh, actually moving backwards and not forwards. So as we age, we're moving towards the past, we're moving towards our death. Um, and so there is no future, there's only the present and the past, and we're all moving towards the past. And I just that just did something to my brain, just reading her work and hearing her talk about it. It's that, such a beautiful yeah. novella. If you have not read it, it's it so good immediately. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, through talking to her, um, we, I worked through a story that also uses that conceptualization of time. And um, in that story, uh, we have um, a, a grad student who uses this conceptualization of time to travel back to the past to bring back um, an ancestor that has been written out of history um, because she was like a female um, leader and you know was written out of history and you know wasn't put down in the history book so she's like a, a PhD student that's going back in time to engage with this ancestor and bring back that knowledge uh, to the present. I see a hand reaching for a microphone. <laughs> trying to figure out if I have something intelligent to add. Um, but I guess the only way, it's kind of repeating myself, but the way I think about time is thinking about the past and the way the past always haunts us. Um, and so how the past is the past, but it's always like present in, in, like in our bodies, you know, in the spaces, in buildings. I'm really interested in how, like, um, how buildings hold on to history. Um, yeah. Would you mind if I asked you to talk more about your interest in how buildings hold on to history? I mean, well, I'm thinking in particular about this. Um, I wrote a short story, the one is very true. It's called The Hollow, and it's kind of about how this house, um, spoiler, it just kind of traps like men who are bad. Um, mm -hmm. And then the person in the present is trying to fix the house, and then it, like based on interactions, she kind of the other person talks to her about how there is no there is no fixing, like there's no way to like fix you. In, yeah. Um, but I studied I my undergrad and I have, I have two degrees in architecture, but um in our school, I think because I did my undergrad in Nigeria, there was a lot about like new buildings and like how to make new things work. And there wasn't a lot of interest in what had come before us, like walking around Lagos, like what does, is there in Lagos architecture? The, the buildings that are still standing are just like leftovers from like colonialism. Um, so these are some, just like what do the buildings say about where we've come from? But even in more domestic spaces, like 
what does the arrangement, what does the layout of, of a particular house or a particular space say about the people who were there before you? Like, what are the things, what are the materials, what are the objects left behind? What do they say about how they lived and, you know, how we came to be just? Yeah, that's beautiful too, because it, it uh, thinking in terms of architecture and what it holds and how it can't be fixed because it's, it's a part of it. It's it's been there, you know. It's been built through and in that, and there's no removing that history from it. Um, that's yeah, that's really powerful to think. Then, what does that do to the lives in the present? And and what do you? How do you build from there? You know, what do you? How do you uh, keep that history in mind? And perhaps thinking in new ways. Uh, how do you take that basis of in infrastructure and do something? different or deal reckon with the hauntings. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's really beautiful. I had a question in mind and then now just saying that the, the, the question fled. Um, that was about, let me go back to the cheat sheet. Oh, no. It's about, oh, yes. Okay, I was going to ask too, if you wouldn't mind specifically talking about a little bit, Amy, about your story, Masquerade Season, um, published in Four Magazine. I, I'm sorry, going back, but it um, is, a, to me, a beautiful and heart-wrenching story about uh, brings in past and present, and then relationships um, between family and what and societal expectations, too, and what that does. I would just love to hear you um, perhaps just talk a little bit about what that story means to you. Okay. Um, okay, thanks for that. I wrote that story at Clarion. Um, Clarion, which week during Clarion? Uh, I think it was, I think it was my fifth week. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> That's the burnout week. Yeah. <laughs> um, so for people who don't know, the masquerade season starts with a little boy who's walking back home and takes a shortcut and then um, stumbles upon these three masquerades and in Nigeria, when we like masquerades are these elaborate um closed beings that are used for um that come out for festivals and things like that. And so he comes across three of them and they, they say they belong to him and they're there to do whatever he wishes. And then he takes them home. And over the course of his story, his mother starts to ask of him to give you know her of these masquerades and so there's the question he starts to wonder like how much do I owe to my mother how much of these masquerades really belong to me uh even though they say they're mine do I really have permission to like give off them um and then it, the story ends where it, where it does but I think I was thinking about a lot in that time about family and basically what family asks of us mm -hmm. um and at one point, so we decide to push back because the the boy in the story considers himself like a, a good son and he's been good up to that point. But um, like thinking about his like duty versus happiness, like duty always comes up for me, I think, um, especially because I'm a Nigerian daughter and yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, grow up and like take care of your parents when you have like extra income you're supposed to like send you back home you're supposed to take care of your younger ones and um so at what point do you yeah what do you choose like duty versus versus sorry for going up book but i was just i found the story really powerful and wanted to ask you while you're here and then also to get everybody else interested and because i think that we don't often think of um the familiar relationships in connection with structural issues, and they're extremely important to the way that we think about how we are building futures, how we are building relations, how we are encoding them in buildings, and what that looks like. And um, yeah, I was just interested in your thoughts on that. And so to go further off, but um, <laughs> Yvette, I'm interested in you talking, would you tell us more about being a Sarangano and what that means to you? And I'm thinking about people to things freely available online as well. Um, Yvette has an essay in Fantasy Magazine about this and about Afro-surrealism, um, but I'd love to, to hear you talk a little bit more about how, um, yeah, how this has unfolded for you, 
how you came to, to, to this way of thinking about your work and, and your writing. Yeah, um, so Sarangano means uh, storyteller, but I just said that translation doesn't really capture what it is. Um, storytellers are, you know, both historians, uh, they impact uh, knowledge, songs, uh, music, history. Um, and so, uh, you know, thinking of like how to engage with, you know, that they're oral storytellers, so that oral history. Um, so I, you know, I write fiction, so I think of myself as a Sarangano of the page. Uh, and not the stage. Um, so just kind of going back to to uh, to my roots. So the traditional uh, stories that Sarangano tells are called uh, Angano. These are uh, fables, fantasy stories. So when I've been engaging with fantasy, um, you know, thinking about you know going back to those roots, going back to uh, to to Ngano and uh, engaging with that. And uh, these stories are. Uh, filled with, you know, with magic, with, uh, with myth. And um, so I, you know, you know, you've mentioned uh, Afrofuturism that, you know, this is a contemporary term, but, you know, it's already existed. So uh, these Nganos, I think of them as Afro-surrealism where we have um, this mundane world with, with magic in it and using this magic to um, critique uh, the world around us, which is what some Nganos uh, do. Um, I also wanted to ask y'all, how, how do you see the potential for, because a lot of people I think would dismiss fiction as, as somebody mentioned as, you know, just escapist or, um, at art as, uh, being separated from, you know, societal change or critique. How do you see, um, your fictional and artistic work impacting society or challenging current social structures or how does it, um, how does that open, like, how do you see your work, I guess, the artistic or the fictional, the world around us? Um, that was not very well worded. Hmm. I struggled with this question a lot. Because <laughs> um, I had, yeah, it's easy to sort of write it off as just being es escapist or you know, it's not real, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I guess for me, I don't really make that distinction between what's real in the mind versus what's real in reality. Um, obviously, like, I know what is real and what isn't, but I think there's an importance in tapping into the imagination in that sense. Because again, you know, like, the only way that we can really progress as a society, as, as humanity, is to imagine the impossible, right? Uh, science doesn't get anywhere without thinking and developing thesis and hypotheses and ideas that are seemingly impossible. Um, and so in the same vein, you know, I, I see my artwork functioning in that way where, you know, you may not ever see a person made up of glittery stars and cosmic mass, but, um, but it does have a real world impact in terms of how people see themselves, right? Uh, there was a particular instance years ago where I had this image that I made up on a wall, and this black family came in, and this little girl just got so excited, and she goes, oh, look, it looks like Black Panther, it looks like Black Panther. And so I started to really take that into consideration to say, like, well, now she's seen this image of a Black person, right, and she, that's going to have an impact on her, I, I like to hope, right, a positive impact that's going to have positive change um, in terms of how she sees herself in relation to society when society tries to you know, there's just, just negative stereotypes, right, associated with blackness. Um, so the imagination isn't, isn't important to rewrite our stories, rewrite our narratives, um, and to just bring about a new sense of identity. Yeah, I'd love to uh, to echo that. I see um, art and writing uh, in general, you know, helping with that uh, imagination, because, you know, you can't do, you can't, uh, do anything actionable in the real world without imagining it. You know, going back to Afrofuturism and abolitionists, that you know they had to imagine a future where Black people were free for them to be able uh, to do that. So it starts with uh, imagination and fiction. I uh, can do that. Um, in my own work in Drinking from Grief and Wells, I am uh, using fiction to critique systems of power, uh, specifically um, the Zimbabwean uh, government. Um, in uh, the story that I mentioned with the houses uh, that are disappearing, um, that comes as a result of um, 
the, uh, the that community um, digging a well in uh, a graveyard. So they had been promised uh, piped water uh, from the city councils, the city planner, um, and then that promise was not delivered because that money was pocketed by co corrupt city planners and corrupt uh, politicians. So in that story, the community takes matters into their own hands and they, they uh, dig this uh, well in a graveyard and then there's um, consequences from that, which are in the form of like a spiritual consequences where these houses in the neighborhood start disappearing. But you know, nobody cares that this neighborhood and these people are disappearing um, and thinking about how a lot of communities, communities of color, poor, poor communities are disregarded. How can an entire neighborhood disappear and nobody uh, bats an eyelid? And that happens in the real world with uh, with gentrification, with neocolonialism, with uh, entire communities that are food deserts. Um, so thinking about how to use you know magic to explore those real things um, that happen uh, in the real world, and uh, hopefully that when you read that fiction, you can look at the real world, look at the uh, urban deserts in your own city, look at those communities in your own city and see what you can do uh, to make the world a better place, basically. Um, yeah, it's hard. Um, I think, though, that there's something about just an insistence on existence that is part of it. I think growing up in Lagos, in Nigeria, where women are just like considered less than to put people in the POVs of these women feels powerful to me. I think just the just the act of creation in itself is a powerful thing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really to think that, so for my novel, um, I had to go interview some communities that had been um, illegally evicted from like waterfront settlements in Lagos. And I remember one, one of these places I was sat down with the leaders of the community and I felt so humbled that they would even pay attention to like a little girl like me. Mm -hmm. And then when I was leaving, they said, tell them, tell them what they're doing is wrong. And I was like, I'm only writing fiction. I felt really like, you know, powerless in that moment. It's like, what am I doing? But I think that when like somebody emails me and says, hey, I read this story about like breastfeeding and I nobody has captured this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I think there's something powerful about just in the space of somebody reading a story, like being forced to see somebody else being this, being forced to, to inhabit somebody else's experience that that feels powerful to me, yeah. Yeah, I think there is a power in that. And you're reminding me of uh, an essay that I think Valerie Valdez wrote for um, the Science Fiction Writers Association uh, blog about second person point of view and how uh, it's it's a it's a point of view that authors of color tend to use, um, but that white readers hate because white people hate being told you are doing this, you are doing that, and so there's something uh, about that power of fiction to shape people's perspectives that, um, and also to like put in someone else's shoes that like for white Westerners can be so uncomfortable that they'll refuse to read things written in second person because they don't want to be told where people of color like we've had to do this our entire lives we've had to understand how you see the world and also how we see the world in order to survive and um, there's something really fascinating there about like it can be so powerful sometimes that people are completely uncomfortable with it right and um that has a lot, a, a lot of impact, even if it's not something that is perhaps directly confronting the people in power. It is right through this other means. Um, I'm interested in what kinds of imaginative possibilities you would like to see opened more. Um, whether that is through your own writing, um, through others, maybe examples of people that you think are really doing this kinds of. Uh, work or like what you would like to see more of in either artistic or fictional. You can tell when I've asked them a question that I didn't put on the list. <laughs> um, well, so I don't know how many photographers are in this room, but um, what you see is not the traditional format of photography. <laughs> um, and I've 
I've had many conversations with self and others in the field about, you know, is this photography, is it not? And how, when you, when you start to bend and stretch the indexical nature of photography um, and its relation to reality, like, you know, what does that do? And I would like to see more people do this. Um, and not so much in the same exact style that I'm doing it, but to take those liberties, you know, um, because what I see myself doing and others who are working in similar formats is that it's sort of a protest against the colonial way of thinking about seeing the world through a lens, right? Uh, with photography being created and announced in Europe, um, it's always sort of had this foundation, um, with, at least to me in this col colonized perspective. And so this is my protest to say, you know, we can see the world differently, um, whether you are European or you come from other places of the world, um, and that photography, going into the weeds about the philosophical discussions on truth and photo, but um, but there's there's room, right, for uh, for independent truth or your own stories to be told through mechanisms such as uh, photo manipulation or digital compositing, um, or just thinking about the photographic medium in a way that goes beyond uh, the tradition. Uh, something I always tell my students is to honor the tradition in which you're working from, but also push past it, um, because that's how we make new strides, that's how we bring about new ideas. Um, and so, yeah, I, I would just like to see more people not be scared to push the boundaries and, um, yeah, and just honor themselves in their process. That's so beautifully put. I think I will not contribute. <laughs> you captured it really well. <laughs> I mean, maybe last year, I only I started reading the African Reason Anthology. I don't know if you've read that. And if you had asked me the question last year, I would have said I wanted to see more stories like that. Mm -hmm. But they're starting to exist more and more. Um, because I think before now, I didn't see too many stories about like a future of like people looking into like African future but also like grappling with the past in those, in those narratives. Sometimes I think what I used to see before were so far ahead that it felt cut off from the present and the past. But now the story that I'm starting to see are also like grappling with the now and the past. And so I can see more of that, yeah. Yeah, I've, in that anthology too, Yvette has a story in that anthology. Um, I'm also thinking, as you're talking about like grappling with the past and the future, uh, Wole Talabi's story, um, it's, a, it's something about electric mothers. Yeah, a, dream. a dream of electric mothers in that anthology, I feel like really captures that, um, the way that the past is implicated in the present is implicated in the future and how all of those are intermingling. Yeah. Um, I, at. What was that last question? Okay, one of the things that we had kind of asked was like, how do these alternative spaces and times or surrealist spaces and times open up imaginary possibilities for world building? And, and how do you think your work contributes to like new worlds or new ways of thinking about humanity? This one's on the list. <laughs> <laughs> um. Um, for me, it's about the reduction of separateness. Um, and so as a photographer working in this format, I, I think about my process to make the image along with the concept and the aesthetics that I use. It's not just, that's been something beautiful, have people praise you for it. Like, that's the least of my concerns. It's just um, the blending of multiple time, spaces, locations, um, and things that are seemingly on separate ends of the spectrum, right? This sort of dichotomy of duality that we exist in in, in Western society. Um, the process of blending images together is alluding to the fact that there is no separateness, right? Um, some of this is sort of coming from Buddhist thoughts. I'm not a Buddhist by um, practice, but they're, I had, I'm really interested in, in there's their approach um, in ways of living uh, because it's just, yeah, anyways, I'm not gonna go too deep into that. <laughs> um, but yeah, but just creating a more holistic way of being, right? So 
seeing yourself reflected in the cosmos, reflected in the earth. Um, again, just this sort of fractal way of thinking about um, about reality, that everything is connected in one sense to another. Um, with a philosophical um, principle or idea called eminence, in which, in which says there's no separation between object and subject. Um, and so that's something that's really interesting to me in terms of how we think about um, you know, just everything here, right, in our, in our culture and society. Um, and so yeah, it, at the end of the day, power, sovereignty, connection, um, and just seeing ourselves like in each other and in the world. Um, could you repeat the last part of the question? I think I was asking how your work um, inspires new ways of building the world around us or uh, new ideas, new, new versions of humanity and who we can be as humans. Um, yeah, you know, going back to Afro-Sudism about, you know, looking at the present and um, leaning into the absurdity um, of uh, the present moment. So, uh, for example, I have another story in that collection where um, there is an immortal uh, leader um, on an island and using that to explore what it's like to grow up under uh, a dictatorship. Um, so growing up under the Mugabe dictatorship, which was 36 year um, dictatorship and the absurdity of um, that experience. So using something like immortality to capture uh, what does it mean to have a leader that's in power forever. Um, so that's kind of like how I approach uh, speculative fiction is using it to explore the present, the absurdity and horrors of the present. Um, and, you know, maybe one day in the future, you know, these, uh, these absurdities will <laughs> not exist. Yeah, I, I just also don't know that I have such, <laughs> such ambitions. Um, I think that, um, there's a lot about the present and a lot of realities that are overlooked already. Mm -hmm. And I'm perhaps more interested in looking at those, like looking at um, all, the, all the possible versions of realities that exist currently um, and seeing how those play out. Like, because there's so much that we overlook. Um, and so I'd like us to focus on that. <laughs> I mean, Penny, I see. I think that is opening imaginative possibilities for world building. Like that is, it's extremely important to see all of the things we're overlooking now because without seeing that, uh, the, there's so many possibilities that are walled off, right? But if you can see the alternate realities that are here, that exist in the present, it opens new ways of of, of building futures, right? The new possibilities that we might think are impossible, like like Granville was saying. Um, makes the impossible seem possible, makes the impossible actually possible just by recognizing those alternative realities that are there. You are doing this work. <laughs> we asked too many questions of self-effacing writers who are brilliant about their own work and I can't get them to just like extol their own virtues. So I should have been doing this myself. <laughs> um, I, I do wanna, I think we're gonna wrap up this kinds of Portion, but I want to ask um, as we close if there is anybody's work that you are just really excited about right now. Like, who is it that is, you know, making your imagination fire? Um, and then I'll, the last thing I'll ask is about um, where we can find you and to repeat titles of forthcoming work and things. But first, like, who's, who's inspiring you right now? I mean, we just spoke about Wally Tel I think I really like Wally's work and all of the work that that space is doing right now um, with um, African pictures. Um, um, I think about Leslie Neka um, She's like a North Star for me, I think. Um, in speculative fiction. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, same here, Leslie uh, and Rima also, like, when I read that collection, again, <laughs> it was so exciting to kind of see um, an African writer, like, playing with, like, mythology, and, and you know, that gave me permission to do that myself. Uh, also, your work uh, is a big inspiration uh, as well. Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, Shingai and Jerry Kakunda, who I, I mentioned in the time travel novella. 
Um, okay, okay, Messi uh, is doing a lot of brilliant work. Um, yeah, just it's a really exciting uh, time for African um, African uh, fiction right now. So it's exciting to kind of see how everybody's like experimenting. Have inspirations? Yeah. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my inspirations are a little bit different. Um, so, I mean, there's a photographer, Michael Owuna, uh, who's a Nigerian Swedish artist. Uh, he's working amazingly and impactful and powerful. He's also using the cosmos as a, a way to refine uh, Blackness here in America um, and then give people that sense of divinity and beauty uh, that they deserve as, as humans. Um, there's the idea of emptiness, Buddhist thought that has really sort of consumed me lately. Um, and how emptiness was like the truest state of the universe. And I need to tap into that and research a lot more. But I'm excited and I whenever I can find the time to really do the research. Um, <laughs> um, science is always in the back of my mind as well, you know, like the James Webb telescope and sort of that idea of looking at the past, which is our present and then also our future. There's a lot of sort of conceptual ideas embedded in that. Um, so yeah, inspirations for me come from all sources, music, media, science, you name it. Um, oh, I will say Tommy Adeyemi uh, in her series, Children of Blood and Bone and Children of Blood and Virtue, I think is the second one. She has her third one that's coming out, that doesn't be. I love her writing, I know it's for young adults, but I don't care. Um, the way that she just, she speaks about uh, the futurity, futurity of Black people um, and tapping into like Yoruba culture, and, you know, like I learned so much about that, you know, again, as someone who doesn't have, you know, direct ties to African cultures, but um, it just all super really exciting, so. Yeah, thank you for broadening that beyond, you know, simply people, but also ideas and things that are in New York right now. Um, I'm also going to throw out a shout out that Wole Talabi's debut novel should be coming out, I think, in a couple of years. There was an announcement of it anyway. Um, and then I always have to do a plug for Tade Thompson, his work I absolutely adore and um, is inspiring me right now. And this little book I picked up on Amazon called Black Quantum Futurism, which is edited by Rashida Phillips, I believe. And um, Great stuff if you are interested in breaking Western ideas of temporalities and time. Um, I'm going to end by asking you to once again extol your own virtues, but tell us where you can be found on social media or on the interwebs and um, remind us of your forthcoming work or events so that we can keep that in mind and follow. Um, so, yeah, you can find me on Instagram. First name on Twitter, last name Rainbow Carol. Um, my website, of course. Um, actually, just published a my first artist book through the Visual Studies Workshop in Rochester, New York, called Dark Matter, uh, which is fusing together both photographic imagery and poetry to, you know, again try to uncover this idea of origins and uh, evolution of humanity. Uh, I have a solo exhibition out in Florida for my project called In the Finite Infinitely, which taps into sort of the evolution of humanity through uh, this crazy scientific idea that I came across called the transcension hypothesis, which is not about evolving out in, into outer space, but into inner space. And so I've taken some artistic liberties with that to um, think about the inner space of self and the psyche and how that's where evolution can also start within you know, ourselves and our society. Um, I'll be teaching a workshop at Main Media Workshops this summer if anyone wants to learn how to do this. Um, so yeah, there's other things that I'm not remembering, but um, yeah, find me on social media. Let's connect and feel free to ask me questions. Um, on Twitter and Instagram, I'm uh, Lisa underscore uh, Tbeg, and then my website is my full name, uh, Ivelisa Ndovu. So you can uh, yeah find me on social media or reach out via uh, my website. Um, and uh, some work that's uh, forthcoming, Drinking From Radio Wells, uh, which is a short story collection. Um, the publication date is March 7th, but I've heard some people have gotten early copies, so you can oh. probably get it now. Um, and um, that is a short story collection that blurs the lines between 
uh, realism, uh, social horror, Afro-realism to explore um, the stories of uh, African women uh, living in uh, Zimbabwe. There's monsters, magic, revenge, feminine rage, and all that good stuff. <laughs> Feminine rage, love it. Yeah. <laughs> um, my website is com. The most I'm teaching a workshop with Teen House on March 4th. It's kind of about crucibles and fiction, uh, like physical, emotional, social crucibles, mm -hmm. where people like either trapped in a space or like, you know, well, whatever. I'll be teaching about that in a couple of weeks. Um, my story collection is coming out with Norton next, early next year. It's also speculative stories set in Lagos, Nigeria. A lot about like Nigerian women and our bodies and, you know, stuff like that. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, and now we can open up to the audience. Do you all have questions that you would, oh, I think we were applauding for Simon. We'll let them not be answered. Questions from the audience for our panel? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm interested in, um, uh, well, I'm not sure of the name. Um, is it Yemi or Tommy? Yemi. Is that your name? <laughs> I'm sorry, I was trying to follow up there. It's okay. Yeah. My name is Femi. Femi. Oh, Femi, yeah, okay. That's what happened. Yeah, so um, you were telling us about your your experience during one of your interviews at the Long Water. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, where these guys are going to be telling you, go tell them, go tell the leaders that what they mean is wrong. Then they are telling you, well, like, hey, I don't think you are in a position to go tell the leaders that what they are doing is wrong. So, I mean, when you said that, my so, mind yeah. came to an interview that was granted by Octavia like, Butler about, about why she writes science fiction instead of any other fiction. And the answer she gave was that science fiction gives you the opportunity to write what you write and get that. <laughs> so then I was asking myself, okay, maybe what they are telling you is that use your story to tell them to get away from you and what you're doing. You know, so I'm just saying that I don't know what you are writing, whether it's science fiction or just any fiction you write. Yeah. If it is science fiction, then you're going to get away from you. Nobody's going to do anything. But of course, on a continent where people hunt you and you know, they with you because they think that your stories are, you know, as a clerical, really clean them, then it becomes a danger, a challenge for you. So it's, it's, it gets to, let me tease your mind about thinking about it. No, yeah, that's right. Um, I remember reading Wizard of the Crow by Ngovi Watiago when I was young, and I, I was just mind blown because I was like, oh, he's talking about politics without talking about politics. Yes. I mean, in my novel, I do talk about these things, but I think why I felt so heavy in the moment was because I felt they needed more immediate help. Like my novel is coming out in 2025. And that, that's not going to help anybody who is like, you know, doesn't have a home and is being haunted by the government. But what I've come to see is that there are people who are actually doing the work okay. on the ground. There are people who are organizing, there are people who are actually fighting, you know, taking the government to court. So all of those things are happening. And then I will do my part by writing this novel. Yeah. I do think that like that fiction does open opportunities for organizing. Though it can inspire people to yeah. to organize who otherwise might not have seen that they could do that. I'm, I'm thinking about how Wizard of the Crow does that. You know, it inspires people to organize too. Yeah. Um, so question? Question. <laughs> it's about imagining futures, possible futures, um, and a community whose past you know, um, have been raptured. Imagine possible futures. Maybe I should come clear. I know Brando has an answer to this. <laughs> Can you repeat the question? So here we are talking about Afrofuturism, and I'm, I'm really interested in Afrofuturism, right? It, it, really, it really caught my attention because then I'm reflecting on how we can make use of the current situation we find ourselves in to better our lives. Okay. Now, the question I'm asking is that the African past is, is one that is beautiful with, with you know, stories that virtually front us of what uh, could be our identity. 
Africa has become a continent of extraction, continent of exploitation. So my question is, we have, with this, with this, you know, um, challenges, is it still possible to imagine futures in terms of looking back into our past? How do we rob of your past? Is there something to hold on to? Here we are talking about how our future is imagines you know, futures, imagines how our present situation can become better tomorrow. So I guess I'm just asking within that context, is, is it possible with all that is happening after how many years of enslavement, 400 years of enslavement, this is what our continent is still about. We've not seen significant progress. It is as simple as image oppression. And so I'm asking, is it possible to imagine possible futures? South Africa standing a chance. I mean, I want to say yes, but, um, <laughs> you know, this is something that I actually have thought about a lot in terms of sort of my sense of privilege, being able to contemplate these sort of unanswerable questions about life and origin stories and spirituality and whatnot. Uh, but people in a war-torn country are probably not going to be considering that, right? Like, they're focused on survival. So. Um, but I think even still subconsciously, and I, I, I cannot speak for these people, right? I have never been to Africa, the, the continent. So I don't fully know their experience, but just looking at past experiences that are adjacent to current events, um, you know, these people, they want to survive, they want to live, right? And that in and, that, in and of itself is an act of futurism, you know, like, you have a choice, right? You can either just sit there and let someone take control of you or kill you or do whatever they wish, um, or you can do everything within your power to, you know, live on. Um, so I, I think it shows up differently. It, it's not going to show up in maybe literature or photography or, you know, the, these things that we're contemplating, but it's just showing up in their everyday every moment that they're, you know, I found water, I found food, I found shelter. Um, and that's that's their, that's the impossible for them, is being able to reach for the ba basic necessities of life. Um, so yeah, so like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I go right. Yeah. Uh, when we talked about beauty versus happiness, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, if I'm going way beyond some of the things we are discussing, I mean, currently, I am an Asante, right? And among the Asante people, we practice the matrilineal kind of um, family. So um, my mother is in charge of us, <laughs> and not my father. Right? And so because of that, we trace the lineage through the female. And so the uncle of my mother's um, brother had the responsibility to make sure we all survive one, progress and develop. And so it is his duty. Now, if you become a man as I am or whatever, right? have a duty right now to ensure that my sister's children survive. So first, I have a duty to fund even before I have a duty to society. And so now we are thinking about progress in a sense, right? What was Africa's uh, line to progress or development? Was it like this? Were they envisioning it like, like this? No, I, I don't think they were imagining it like this or skyscrapers and all, right? You come to Ghana, in, in the northern part of Ghana, people live in house, right? And they use, they use um, um, clay, they use all of those things because these were hot areas, right? They did not have that much coal to, to come up with all of these big structures, right? Now, coming back to beauty versus happiness, I was going beyond <laughs> the <laughs> question. Got to give context. Yeah. Now, where do we go from here? <laughs> do I, as a man, especially in a matrilineal society, as the son, have a duty to myself and society or to the family? And in, in that sense, do I spread myself of happiness and say, ah, I'm not going to be happy the rest of my life, right? I get money, I have to 
feed my family first. Oh, I get money and I have to feed my nephews and my nieces and whatever. And so then I never become happy in life at all going forward. It, is this making sense? How do we do this as individuals, especially as, as an African man who is an Asante? So now I'm not out, out of the scope of Asante. And so aside the Asante, maybe Igbo or Yoruba or whatever, how do we do that going forward? Yeah, I don't I don't know the answer. So like these are like in the story, the story, you know how the story ends. Like I don't want to spoil you, but this person ends up kind of choosing something. I don't know that there's an answer. I don't know what the answer is. Like I if you figure it out, please let me know. I just came back from Ghana researching in Sankofa and uh, one of the beautiful things I discovered is that the, the Sankofa bear, the mythical bear, is feminine. And that goes back to the material system of inheritance. Mm -hmm. The women are part of the Asante kingdom. And, and the woman is the one who births birth community. So she has a responsibility towards making sure that society grows. So definitely, duty and happiness is found there. Because the woman's role, first of all, is to make sure that she brings forth and she makes sure she nurtures the society to become what it is. So in the woman, the woman embodies both the past, the present, and the future, you know, in the account culture. And that is how powerful they are in, in terms of doing decision making. It's, it's one culture in Ghana that women are not sideline at all. They are very powerful because they are the king makers, you know. So in spite of the fact that you have a responsibility towards your nephews and nieces, the purpose is that whatever belongs to that part of the family, the woman's line, remains in the family. And that is why the kinship system is so powerful. We who practice patrilineal system of inheritance, when you go marry, the woman that you marry takes charge of your property and is lost out on the family. But because of the matrilineal system that they practice, whatever it is, the woman is the custodian. And so nothing leaves the family. So they remain powerful, the children remain powerful, and nobody's lost. They have also preserved. I'd love to hear, Penny, what you have to, to say. I'm just I'm just wondering where the happiness part is. Yeah. I, I, I'm hearing the beauty, but I don't, I mean, do you have a solution? Yes, yes. Yeah. Like, what I'm saying is yes. that in, in that responsibility lies happiness. Because the woman. I don't know because I agree with you, but well, because I don't have an answer. I also think yeah, yeah, that this yeah. is a great time for us to uh, promote the work again that has been mentioned of Akwate Amezi, who is a fantastic uh, non-binary author um, writing in African contexts, doing really lovely work uh, that challenges the ways that we can think about gender and systems and what that means in African contexts. And I think now might be the time, Isaac. Or do you want to conclude? Are you doing a conclusion? I can't. I can't. Uh, Am I turning it over to Grand? Well, no. I don't want to interrupt anybody uh, either or cut anyone short. Um, and uh, but well, we I, can also have questions as we mingle around food. food. Um, there, there are there are snacks. There are uh, artworks to uh, engage with visually. Um, and, you know, of course, our, our, our panelists will be here for uh, continued Q&A, uh, but maybe just uh, to, to attempt to wrap this conversation up for the time being and then reopen it in a different format, which is much less formal um, with, with, with food and, 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 and movement and dynamism, is this idea of um, time and space and reality and these notions that we commonly understand through our own particular lens. And I think what's really rich in uh, this panel in particular, but also in sort of fictional uh, speculative spaces in general, is that it opens up to experience other possible conceptions of what's time, of what's individuality, of what is real, versus what is considered strange or unreal, which all of these are culturally contingent concepts. And so engaging with this work allows the opportunity to engage with different forms of reality, which I think therein 
lies the richness for imagining futures where we can begin to imagine not just a singular future where we're all headed, but multiple futures that diverge and converge and come back together. And in a kind of temporality that's not linearly headed in one singular direction, but may double back and may take detours and tangents, but ultimately is constantly in motion. Um, so those are sort of the elements that I congealed. Um, I'd also like to mention briefly, since we were on the concept of, of gender, there's a really uh, African feminist uh, journal uh, where there's an article <laughs> co-authored by Jenna Hanchi, um, and it, cre it creates some uh, dialogue between African feminisms and African futurisms. Oh. So there is, you know, there's spaces to engage with these, uh, the title of the article to you. <laughs> And then I will point you to the journal Feminist Africa, and it is their second issue um, that was released last year. But the essay that Isaac is referring to <laughs> is co-authored uh, by Nian Godfrey Asante, and um, the title is How to Save the World from Aliens Yet Keep Their Infrastructure, which is a quote from a Tade Thompson novel. Um, and we talk about the way that uh, in African context, perhaps, you know, the Audre Lorde quote that is used a lot, you know, the master's tools cannot, um, oh my gosh, why am I blanking? Thank you, dismantle the master's house. Um, we talk about how, uh, like, kind of like you were saying, Tammy, you, the buildings encode things, right? Things are encoded that you can't really get rid of. And so maybe the task isn't to dismantle the master's house in African context, but to reevaluate the use of infrastructure. How do you use it through different logics? And different that's what the article does through some great novels that Tade Thompson wrote that I'm going to continue singing the praises on. Um, thanks for that, Isaac. <laughs> Isaac also has a forthcoming book that I feel like needs to be mentioned before the panel is closed. And the title of that, please. So the title of my forthcoming book is Afrofuturisms, Ecology, Humanity, and Francophone Cultural Expressions. So the reason why I've tried been more silent is that I'm, I'm new to this field of Anglophone speculative fiction, and, and I approach it from my own disciplinary orientation. Uh, but that book is coming out from Ohio University Press in April. So. so you all have many, many books to buy. Um, <laughs> please enjoy some coffee and refreshments. Please enjoy the artwork. And... Um, come and feel free to talk with our panelists. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you.